Hello, Hello. Good, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the Lowell Lecture. Um, we're really proud to offer this opportunity. This is sponsored by the Lowell Foundation, and um, it helps us bring issues of critical importance to our oceans, um, and so we can help convey those messages of importance. Um, tonight we have a great talk about uh, seaweed from Matt Thompson. Matt's been with us since 2007, so for eight years. Um, he came in as an aquaculture specialist. We do a lot of seafood advising here at the New England Aquarium. We work with large companies and we help them buy more sustainable seafood. And so Matt does a lot of aquaculture work. Um, he works a lot on shrimp and shrimp aquaculture. And he's traveled through a lot of Asia doing that work. Um, but tonight he's going to talk about his seaweed and because um, it is so important. But I'll let him go into that. Um, just a few announcements. First of all, we'd like to thank Ocean Approved for supplying us with seaweed beforehand, the smoothies and the tasting. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. And for anybody who came in late and didn't get some or people who really like it and want more, um, they will be doing more samples afterwards. So stop in the lobby on the way out and get some more samples. <laughs> and one more note, we will have one more little lecture next Thursday, and that one's on ocean plastics. So if you're interested in plastic and plastic pollution, come next Thursday. And um, so um, I'm going to leave you with uh, Matt. Before he came to us, he got a master's degree in aquaculture from Sterling University, which is one of the premier aquaculture um, universities in, in the world. Um, and so we've been really fortunate uh, to gain from having Matt here with us. So. If you would now welcome Matt Thompson. So what Michael uh, neglected to mention is that I'm British, and as such, I'm really, really quiet. So I have to use this microphone at all times. Um, I've worked with Michael for, like I say, about eight years now. And that really wasn't the introduction he wanted to give me, but I uh, had to give him a script instead. Um, again, I'd like to offer my thanks as well to Ocean Approved for the, uh, the seaweed samples today. We have a quick show of hands. Who actually tasted any seaweed? Oh. Did you actually taste it? As in, yeah. you get the flavor through? Yeah, it didn't taste. Okay. Uh, if anyone wants to, we, we have a system now with our uh, with our seaweed products um, that we bring into the office for people to share. We have levels. We have beginner, intermediate, and advanced. <laughs> So that was very much uh, a beginner level uh, seaweed product. If anyone wants to try some advanced products, I've got a few snack products here that are a little bit more uh, for the, uh, the acquired taste. Okay, so I'm gonna start first by asking the audience a couple of questions. My first is, how many of you um, eat seaweed regularly? The Ocean Brew guys were waving, excellent. And uh, three or four others, okay, it's not too bad. Did it, is anyone going to be a convert after having smoothies today? <laughs> One, fantastic. <laughs> um, so my next question is, when you see an image like this, does this give you positive or negative feelings? This is obviously uh, lobster fishing in Maine. Can you have a quick show of hands who makes this, you know, gives you a, like a negative feeling when you see this? One, one or two people? Maybe there's people who know a little bit more about right whales? Excellent. Um, so the next question, when you see an image like this, and again, I'm not giving you any context here, is this something you feel positive or negative or just indifferent about? Maybe we start, does anyone feel positive when they see something like this? Okay, a couple of hands. Indifferent? Okay, negative? Okay, we've got some work to do. Fair enough, okay. Um, so a little bit about this. Uh, this work that I'm presenting on today is, um, it comes from a professional development fund that the aquarium offers. It's called the John H. Callium Award. It's a wonderful opportunity for aquarium staff who've been at the aquarium for more than five years to undertake projects that enrich them from a professional development perspective and um, benefit the aquarium in some way. So it's a really great opportunity to come and, and share with you what I found um, having won this award. You might see that this was the 2013 award and we're almost out of 2014. Uh, I do have a wonderful excuse. 
Here she is, my daughter Rose. Uh, so this is taken, I promised my wife I would get a photo of my hats and that, so, uh, wow. Completely distracted now. Um, but seaweeds, anyone who's ever been to the seashore or to the beach knows about seaweeds, we've all seen it. This here is an image from a place called Rottingdean in the south of England. And it's one of those things that, that stick in my mind. I used to go to here and uh, look through the rock pools, what we call tide pools in the UK, and just shift, uh, you know, stick a net underneath and see what you could find. We're all familiar with seaweeds. A few of us might be aware that seaweeds are part of our everyday lives. They're used for products that, are, that make gels and thickening agents. So they're in our toothpaste, they're in our ice cream, and some of us might be a bit more used to having the direct human consumption uh, as nori, a uh, uh, part of our sushi rolls. But in 2013, there seemed to be a real move to recognize seaweed as a superfood. And I'd like to read, this is um, by Maria Finn uh, from the EcoWatch uh, website. And I'm going to read this to you because I can't write like this, so bear with me. Strewn along beaches in tangled clumps, seaweed tells the fractal tales of tides. Anchored in the water, they're an underwater melody. These algae are not just beautiful, but also vital to the ocean's well-being. They're the base of the ocean's food web, and sea creatures need them for sustenance and protection. And it's also the ultimate superfood for us. It's pretty, uh, pretty impressive stuff. Uh, it's not just them. This was on by Nick English by the Huffington Post. Seaweed is the green superfood you're not eating, but you should be. Nick here says that seaweed is filled with antioxidants, calcium, and a broad range of vitamins, uh, and they also contain a fair amount of protein too. But for somebody like me who works in sustainable seafood programs, when I see something like this, I say, okay, great, it's a superfood, but is it a, a sustainable seafood superfood? And so I really wanted to understand, you know, how sustainable uh, is seaweed farming? So to do that, I divert my Cunningham Project uh, proposal to really answer three key questions. The first, is farm seaweed a sustainable sea, uh, seafood? The second, if it is a sustainable seafood, how can a country like China be producing so much of it? And then finally, can we develop a, a decent, uh, productive US industry? So when we looked at seaweed just to, to build up to get some preparation for this project, you really realize just how big farming seaweeds are. It's the second largest aquaculture industry in the world. It's second to freshwater fish. Every year they make 26 million metric tons of seaweed. Only one metric ton comes from wild harvest. The rest of it is aquaculture. To put that in context, if Americans gave up eating all other seafood and only ate seaweed today, we'd be able to feed ourselves for nine years on the production, the annual production of seaweed. So this is no small fry at all. The second is that seaweeds are used in a variety of products. They're used in cosmetics and fertilizers. They're used uh, to produce products for thickening agents and gels. They're used in animal feeds. Um, so really there's a broad range of uses. And there's also a huge diversity in the way that, farm, uh, that seaweed farming occurs uh, and the species that are farmed. So this created a little bit of difficulty for me in the sense that um, the Cunningham Award is about $4,000, or that's the amount I asked for, and it's about two weeks' work. So I really needed to get a very specific focus on what I wanted to achieve. So I decided to focus on kelp farming, and primarily from the food perspective. Kelp is used as a traditional food in China, Korea, and Japan. At the times that I was available to travel, there was, a real, there was an easy opportunity to go and see some of the, the really big farms in China. And we had some wonderful connections over there to act as a tour guide and to translate and to give us a real background. And finally, in the US, the industry is going towards farming kelp. So it was a very easy way to compare the US and Chinese industries. So the next question really becomes, you know, how do you farm a kelp? And here's a little uh, image from um, Ocean Approved's Kelp Farming Manual. And you can see it's a fairly simple life history. This is the basic uh, kelp design here. You have the hold fast where the, the seaweed connects to whatever substrate, be it a rock or a rope in aquaculture. You have a stipe, which basically is kind of like a stem. The big blade, and down the center of the blade is this sorus tissue, 
which is actually pictured here on the left-hand side, this darker element. And the sorus tissue is the one that produces zoospores that are used in reproduction. And then, under the right environmental conditions, this kelp releases many, many thousands of these zoospores. And they, they move around in the water column, and if they're lucky enough to find some substrate, they'll connect and they'll form a, a small sporophyte, which will eventually grow into a new kelp plant. So realistically, when you're farming them in a hatchery, all you really need to do is to recreate those same environmental conditions. And then that releases all those zoospores into the water. The farmer then provides a, a substrate for them. And in this case, it's a very thin nylon uh, string. The, the sporophytes connect to this. And this darkening here just shows how many of those sporophytes are connecting and growing. There's many, many thousands on that string. And here, under the microscope, you can see them with a little bit of the nylon string here. Um, so it's a, a really kind of easy process to get them on in a research perspective, at least. A commercial is perhaps a bit more challenging. So once they've settled on that substrate and they've grown to enough size, you're able to bring them out into the grow out. And again, this uses a very kind of basic technology called a long line. A long line system is basically like an underwater clothesline. You have two moorings at either end, a series of buoys that keep this, uh, the main line here uh, suspended at the right height in the water column. It's about seven feet or two meters. And when you're stocking this farm, you're wrapping that thin nylon uh, streak over, this, over a thicker uh, rope line. And as those sporophytes grow, this, the hold fast grows and then it connects to the main rope as opposed to that nylon line. So it's a really strong connection and it can take all the weight for farming. But this technology is just, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's used in shellfish culture sometimes um, and it's pretty ubiquitous across the kelps that, that I looked at anyway. The other thing to notice is that this is about a thousand feet long. So they're a fairly reasonable name for long lines. So the next question you might ask is, what's a sustainable seafood? And the sustainable seafood program uh, defines a sustainable seafood as that it is caught or farmed in a way that maintains healthy and productive ocean ecosystems for future generations. It's a nice, easy catchphrase. But the reality is that you can't actually quantify sustainability. It's, it, it's just a very, very complex um, component. So what we're really trying to do when we're trying to measure sustainability or we're trying to assess how sustainable that seafood is, is we look at a series of individual impacts and assess how that product deals uh, with those impacts. So in wild fisheries, we're concerned with things like fisheries management, uh, bycatch impacts, habitat impacts. And in aquaculture, we're interested in um, a, a range of issues. For example, pollution. So if you have a, a land-based farm and you're feeding food, not all of it's going to be eaten, there's going to be some waste food that's going to create some nutrients that gets flown out into the, the local environment and that may cause eutrophication, for example. We deal with issues like feed. So how efficient is it to produce a farmed animal? How much food are you using? What are the, what's the sustainability of the ingredients used in that food? If it includes marine ingredients like fish meal and fish oil, how much of it is it using? When we look at disease, disease can impact the farm itself, um, but we're also interested in how it transfers to wild populations or even to other farms. Chemical usage, how much antibiotics are you using, why are you using those antibiotics, do they have a secondary environmental impact? And finally, escapes, whether or not, uh, you know, escapes are always a bad thing for the farm, but whether or not if it's non native, it presents a risk of uh, becoming invasive or potentially interbreeding with native populations. So when we look at seaweed, though, it doesn't really fall into the same category or, or work in the same way that we think about um, something like a shrimp farm or a salmon farm. Pollution, for example, seaweed are extractive, they're using nutrients in the water column, and they can actually improve water quality. Yes, there are times where you can grow so much seaweed, um, well, there are, there are times when local water quality isn't very good and seaweed farms actually have to use fertilizer. But you know, it would have to be poorly managed to, create, to use enough fertilizer to uh, create eutrophication. So generally, pollution is a non-issue. Feed, as we say, seaweeds make their own food. It's basically a non-issue. 
Again, you could have a situation where there's so much seaweed going that it's removing so many uh, nutrients that it affects some of the world populations. But that's generally a, a, a very kind of a random issue. Disease. Seaweeds, like any organism, gets diseases. Uh, but a lot of the diseases that it gets are sort of cool things like green rot and white rot. Um, but they're not the kind of diseases that spread to other farms. And they're not the kind of diseases that um, would spread to wild populations. Most of them are indicative of poor water quality, poor farm siting, or just poor hatchery management. So again, disease isn't really an issue. Chemicals, most seaweed farms certainly don't use antibiotics, and there's very little chemicals that would be applied during the farming process. So again, it's a, a bit of a non-issue. The one thing we do need to worry about seaweeds, though, is escapes. As we mentioned when we looked at the life history, uh, one seaweed plant is able to make many, many thousand new seaweed plants. So if that is a non-native species, it's very easy for it to get out and in some cases be invasive. In fact, um, two of the main species farmed in China, one of them, the Laminaria japonica, is, uh, was accidentally introduced in the 1920s, and now it's become established. And Undaria, which is the other kelp that they farm, is listed by the IUCN as one of the 100 worst or most invasive species in the world. So these are things that we do need to be very careful of if we're introducing a non-native seaweed. And like many aquaculture industries, there's a fair amount of selective breeding that goes on with um, seaweeds. So even if it's native, you might be selecting for things like better growth, um, you know, potentially less uh, disease resistance, etc., or more disease resistance. Um, and in which case, whenever you select for things, you generally start narrowing the genetic variation that that organism has. So there's a potential that when we select for specific criteria with seaweed that will create a... Uh, version that has less genetic fitness. And if that's able to reproduce with some of the wild populations, that could be a problem. But again, it's something that we just need to manage um, carefully. So by and large, farm seaweed really does have a potential to be the next great sustainable seafood. It, it checks a whole lot of boxes on a really basic level. And while there are a few things that we need to look out for, it's largely not an issue. So then, OK. If it's a sustainable seafood, how is it that China is able to produce so much of this? And is this something that we can learn from? China accounts for over 50% of the global seaweed production. So that's 13.5 million metric tons a year. And I think that's about enough to feed America for four years alone. Um, one of the reasons that we went to visit them was that we had timing. This was in spring of 2014. We were able to visit two really large farms that were producing the, uh, the Laminaria japonica, which is kombu, and Andaria, which is wakami, if you're familiar with some of those names. We also had a key contact in the Chinese industry, and that's this guy, Professor Jackson Chen. Uh, Professor Chen was the former director of China's uh, Yellow Sea Research Institute, uh, which is kind of a big deal for that region. Um, he was also a pioneer in developing new strains and technologies in seaweed farming. He had over 50 years' experience. Um, and it was quite funny when we were talking about some of the practices that we think about in America. Dr. Chen said, I did that 50 years ago in my first year. So we're a little bit behind, possibly. Um, he's also a really strong advocate for seaweed farming as a sustainable source and for consumption. He eats seaweed every single day. And when I asked him what was the sort of message he wanted to send Americans when we're thinking about, do we want to eat more seaweed? Is he said, if you eat less meat and you eat more seaweed, you're going to look younger for longer. I don't know if it's true, but he's a very sprightly chap. So you know, maybe he's got some, uh, some lessons after all. So we went to visit Dalian in China. It's uh, to the east of Beijing on the Bohai Sea. This is the, uh, the photograph from my hotel room. Dalian is not the most, um, I guess, glamorous of locations. It's a coastal city. It's very, very large. Um, and it wasn't really as uh, easy to get along if you only spoke English. So I was really lucky to have uh, Professor Chen tag along with me for, for two and a half days while I did this tour. The seaweed farms themselves, we went to visit, are just in this little nook here. It was actually uh, a few hours by taxi. 
these are them shown on Google Earth. Uh, I just want to give you an idea of scale here. From this corner here to this corner here, that's four miles long. It's one mile across. Each and every one of these little black smears is row upon row of long lines farming seaweed. In fact, these are the floating buoys that we're going to see on the video in a second. Each of these is 150 meters long. And when you're going out here, a farm this size, it's just this insane experience when you're in a boat because it's just row after row passes you by, which we're going to see in the video in a second. Um, a farm this size can produce 120,000 metric tons of seaweed a year. It's also seeded, maintained, harvested, and processed all by hand. So a farm this size employs 100 people to maintain the farm and 100 people to process the seaweed. So this is really, really labor heavy work. Um, and it creates a huge amount of employment, which is a good thing. Um, so I'll tell you what, we're going to play the video. So that's going to switch off my microphone. And I'm going to sit quietly and have a drink while I watch this. <laughs> So my uh, remembering my slides was completely out. So I'm going to go back just for a second. These are uh, the, the seaweed species that were being farmed. This is the uh, Laminaria chaponica. What's interesting about this species is that I said it was introduced accidentally in the 1920s, um, and then it's become established. The kind of thing that China sometimes does is it decided to turn this into the, uh, the biggest um, farmed seaweed product in the world. One of the, the key things about this, these farms were buying um, this particular strain. It's, a, 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 it's bred for being more temperature resistant, so it's able to be farmed for longer and warmer temperatures. One of the key reasons that global seaweed production doubled from 2002 to 2012 was the establishment of this particular strain. So there it is. You can also see the whole fast in my hand over here. My terrible long hat. Um, this is the uh, the Andaria. This is a, a native species to China. In this case, the farms didn't select anything. They weren't buying this. They were producing it themselves. 
Um, this, this is basically a higher value, value product. So I've gone past this. The Andera, they chopped the hold fast, that small little piece off, and that was the only part that was used for purposes other than human consumption. So here they were, they were exported to Japan to have uh, different products removed. When you see here, a lot of the, the staff here again were, were operating, there were about 30 people sitting on the, uh, the shore just chopping up these uh, seaweed products here. That was it for the first farm, but the second farm we had the opportunity to visit the, uh, the processing. It was vertically integrated, it owned its own massive farm, um, but it also processed um, seaweed for direct consumption and for value-added goods. So the, the processing line begins here, where the seaweed is fed on a conveyor into this boiler room, where it's blanched in uh, salt water. From there, it's put into concrete tanks filled with water. Um, it is actually clean water and bagged salt. And this is really where they're trying to get at the, the human consumption piece. So there's more effort to be uh, a little bit cleaner, believe it or not. They live in their salt water for four days. And then they put these huge concrete blocks on to try and compress it and get as much water out of that seaweed as possible. Once they've done that, it goes to more manual processing. Uh, there's a room full, again, probably of about 50 people. And all they're doing is they're stripping the fronds off the seaweed and they're taking the main stripe, the central stripe, out. This central stripe is what they use for direct um, human consumption. So that goes into this uh, into seaweed that you find at restaurants and pretty much everywhere. This is actually a, a pork stew, and it really was delicious. Um, as I mentioned before, beginner, intermediate, and uh, advanced, this was very much a, a beginner uh, kind of flavor. And that's coming from a guy from England where we think premium seafood is deep fat fried in beer batter, <laughs> which is very, very tasty too. Uh, but this stuff, when you're eating it, you can really convince yourself that it's kind of like green pepper. It's not anything um, that's particularly extreme. When they were making the value-added products, it got a little bit more technical. This is part of their processing line. Uh, essentially what it is is kind of like a series of um, industrial tumble dryers where those little bits of seaweed are chopped up, they're cooked a little bit more, and they're consistently dried to create these small, teeny little um, fragments of wakami. This is added to soups uh, and other products, so it's, it's put in dry or sold dry and then it's put in and sort of rehydrated in the cooking process. Um, I guess well, the fascinating thing about this was once it had gone through the lines and so it turned into this tiny little uh, greenish black uh, flakes, they had six people sitting on a production line with tweezers individually going through some of these things to try and find any uh, marine invertebrates and remove them. So at all stages, there's a lot of labor involved. Um, I have a few bags that brought them over. If anyone can find a marine invertebrate, then I'll be surprised. But there we go. You know, another thing when we were there, the, there was actually a lot of interest by the processors to um, create products for the US market. And so one of the guys fished out this thing, um, this snack food, with the idea that this might be something that Americans would be interested in. Visually, I'm not so sure. Um, but these things were salty, they were sweet, they were crunchy, and unlike a lot of the snack food seaweed stuff, they maintained their crunchiness. So this was actually, I felt, a really tasty product, and I had some stuff that, that I brought around to an earlier lecture for the aquarium uh, that was a year out date that people ate and really loved, so maybe they're onto something with this one. <clears throat> And then the final value-added product is probably the pre-packaged seaweed salads that we find at a lot of restaurants here. Um, the one, the bright green one, is from the Andaria. That's a slightly more pricey version. And then the other side is from the Japonica, Namira Japonica. And again, what was strange to me is that the cheaper version tasted, I thought, a lot better. It had a sort of a, you know, less seaweed flavor, a little bit more um, stocky. It was actually really good. So there we go. So why is China so successful at farming seaweeds? Well, the first thing that was really apparent was there's a huge community support for seaweed farming. 
The local community, when they see a huge seaweed farm like this, they see it as indicative of really good local water quality, that this is being used to raise food. So they, they, they saw a seaweed farm as a very positive thing. The next thing they had was a degree of pre-permitting. So instead of, uh, so it was very easy for these seaweed farms to get a permit to create a farm, even the size that we saw earlier. Uh, the farm that we went to that was on that map has only been in operation for about 10 years. In China, they pre-classified the water quality based on the amount of nitrates that were in the water. So uh, a system like this, where the nitrates were over 50 parts per million, was sort of an A-class um, for seaweed farming. So it was easy for them to get into the farming practice. They also had these very specific varieties of laminaria that made production a lot easier and a lot longer um, window to produce seaweed. So technology, access to technology to farm. And they had a really important and big local market to, to, for direct consumption and a really big export market in Japan for some of the products. But it does face challenges. The most principal challenge, they said, was finding qualified staff and young people who were really interested in being seaweed farmers. And that's because, you probably saw, that is pretty much back-breaking work. It's not exactly the warmest temperature to be out there. Um, and so they just they couldn't find people who would really want to be involved in seaweed farming. There was rising labour costs. As we said, there's a huge uh, labour force here. So as soon as the minimum wage increased, then uh, that obviously created a lot of financial problems for them. And then, interestingly, in the city of Dalian, where there used to be more farms across, the cities were deciding that tourism was more important, and they were basically removing the permits to farm seaweed. The interesting thing is, once you got out of the city, um, the other towns really saw the value in the amount of employment they produced and prioritized them. But it's interesting to see that they're being displaced. So OK, we've learned a little bit more about how China can produce so much seaweed. Other lessons that we can learn um, from them, and can we understand why or how we can uh, expedite a US domestic industry? But before we get into that, again, I'm going to ask you some questions. The first question, one well, question really, um, one of the key challenges is how to get Americans to eat seaweed. So is there a name that you prefer more than some of the others? These are the names that have been tossed out by various people. Uh, seaweed, pretty basic. Sea vegetables. And somebody suggested marine macrophytes, which I guess is for you know the scientists back home, maybe. I don't know, but let's, let's start with a show of hands. Anyone from marine macrophytes? Excellent, we have. We always have one. I'm glad to see we still have one. Um, sea vegetables. Interesting. Okay, it was probably about twenty uh, percent. And seaweed. Wow. You guys are completely different from the aquarium. I, I don't understand that. I would have thought the aquarium folks would be all for seaweed, but they're not for sea vegetables. And you guys are all for seaweed. Well, I support you, actually. I think seaweed is seaweed. Let's just call it what it is. <clears throat> we had somebody come up with the idea of uh, sea kelp earlier. Sorry, not sea kelp. Right. Sea kale. Brain's getting fried. Apologies. Um, so, yeah, so what is happening on the US East Coast? We have a really uh, small but developing industry. There's currently seven US producers in operation, but they have a really great support system. So they have folks like um, Dr. Charles Yarish at the University of Connecticut, who's uh, supporting them on a research basis. They had funding from NOAA to commercialize the production of seaweed. There's a really strong collaborative environment. So the, the seaweed farmers and companies like Ocean Approved are out there sharing best practices on how to farm seaweed. And they're really interested in getting more people into the industry. There seems to be a really good public interest as well. I mean, A, the number of people that come to this lecture. But there was also, uh, uh, for the first time, a, a seaweed festival in Maine. So there does seem to be a growing interest in seaweed as a whole. And finally, the demand for sustainable seafood. There are more and more consumers and businesses out there that are prioritizing um, sustainable seafood and asking questions about where their seafood is coming from. So, some, some good opportunities for the development of this industry. I had the opportunity to visit Ocean Approved Farms. Um, this is Paul Dobbins, you probably see him on the way in. He didn't actually get any opportunity to sort of approve this photo, so I hope he isn't too upset that I've thrown it up there. Uh, uh, all insulation, all right. <laughs> Thanks. 
Um, Solution Approved um, are a vertically integrated company. They own their own hatchery, farm, and processing plant. They farm three native species of kelp, um, the primary one being the sugar kelp. And um, you can, I mean, they sell primarily to food service, so they're in hospitals, they're in schools. Um, they sell to uh, the flatbread pizza company and um, other sort of top-end restaurants, as I understand it. Uh, you can also go onto their website, oceanimprove.com, and you can buy direct from them um, some of their products. Here is a Google Earth image of Ocean Approved seaweed farms. And it's pretty obvious to see you can't actually see any seaweed farms on here. And that's primarily because the US farms are tiny. They're only about 2,000 square feet wide. They do have about 16,000 uh, feet of line. But they're not in any way, shape, or form any comparison to the Chinese farms. And it's also sort of underwhelming when you go and see them from a boat. Here is their farm off to the right here. They're using far less buoys. Um, and that's because a lot of the, the action is well beneath the surface, two meters beneath the surface. Uh, so again, if you compare that to what we saw in China, in terms of a visual impact, this thing is, is just really negligible. One other thing I point out on this is you can see the amount of frost that's on the boat here. This was a really, really cold day. It was about minus five before you got onto the boat. Probably felt like minus 20 once you were on the boat. I don't know how Paul does it. This, you have to be a tough guy to farm seaweed. It is hard work and it's cold work. I'm too lazy for it. Uh, so we also had the opportunity to see some of these seaweeds growing. So here was a little uh, baby kelp that had been on the, uh, on the rope for not very much time. It's sort of looking a little bit forlorn, but uh, what's great about it is between two and, four, uh, two and four weeks' time, this is how big that seaweed is going to be. Under optimum conditions, uh, these kelps can grow five and a half inches a day, according to Paul. So it's really incredible um, to see the growth. I, I do actually apologize for the fact I look a bit like a seaweed terrorist here. Um, believe it or not, I'm actually smiling. I, I don't quite know how that came about, but uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to be friendly in so it doesn't quite come off. So here we are in uh, Ocean Approves Hatchery. Um, and really, it's, what's, the, the reproductive potential of seaweeds is so great. That to see their entire seven farms, they only really have about six to eight fish tanks with these tubes in. Um, so that really helps them. They don't need a lot of space. Another thing you can see from this is that all of the materials, pretty much, are from hardware stores and big box stores. One of the key challenges they face is keeping costs down. So one of the ways they do that is sort of a MacGyver approach to aquaculture to try and put everything together that you can buy from the store and and farm away. This is their kelp farming manual that's on their website. As I say, this is a, a, a resource for people to learn pretty much everything there is to know about how to farm seaweed. But the real innovation, I guess, for Ocean Approved is not how to farm seaweed, but how to create a product that is um, that is sort of recognizable by Americans, food that, that you want to eat. This is their slaw cup, uh, cup kelp, which you can buy off their website. They also produce uh, kelp rounds. So one of the other advantages that Ocean and Proof have, because they're not able to compete with the, the dry product that you see in China, is that they're trying to go for a very kind of premium fresh market. So the, the difference between the, their seaweed salads and some of the imported seaweed salads is they're not using food dyes, for example. Um, and also they have this Made in America brand. And that's really important for them for the, the sort of local food movement. But they also see a real potential for export because when people see that Made in America brand, they get the idea of you know, pristine uh, environments, excellent water quality. And um, even in places you know, where perhaps water quality isn't so great, that's going to carry a lot of weight. So there's potential for them to export as well as to, uh, to feed um, 
to feed us. So what's the what's the problem really? Like why are, is our industry kind of still a little bit small? Well, one of the key challenges is obtaining permits to farm, and that's a lot because aquaculture faces a, a kind of a not in my backyard kind of approach to things. The people's sort of gut reaction is to feel um, to not support aquaculture. So that's why I showed you at the very start of this um, presentation this image of lobster fishing. We have a, a really kind of uh, positive feeling, generally speaking, about lobster fishing. It has that nice kind of rustic feel. And people don't feel that when they see this occurring maybe outside their window. So maybe what we need to do is learn a little bit from the Chinese and recognize that when we see these buoys farming seaweed, that we're seeing sustainable seafood sea being produced, that we're seeing good water quality, and we're, we're really kind of seeing something that's very positive from our environmental perspective and a good thing. And then maybe we can change a little bit of this attitude um, and, and we can get a few more permits. The second question is, we need to improve consumer recognition of seaweed as food. And this really ties in, well, A, with the smoothies we got earlier, but also with the aquarium's sustainable seafood messaging. This is the advice we give consumers. And right at the top here, try something new. I think that you know, we all today got a chance to try some, uh, some seaweed, but this is what we need to do. More and more, we need, to, um, we need to sort of make those efforts to try these things. I've got to my point uh, in my department and in the research department where people see me coming. They know I've got a new seaweed product that I bought from the supermarket. I'll tell you, about 20% of people just put their hands up and say, don't even come anywhere near me. Another like 30% love the stuff, and then we have this, these people in the middle. But that's what we need to keep doing. We just need to keep trying, find that seaweed product we actually like. Um, we need to ask questions, you know, we want to know where your seaweed is from and how it's farmed. Another opportunity is to request sustainable seafood. So if you're at your local restaurant, and maybe one of the things that you should suggest is that they start trying some seaweed products and maybe refer them to Ocean Approved, for example. But it's the only way to get some of these products more, um, more available to us. And then stay informed. Um, you can look at resources like ours, the NEAQ Seafood. We have our Ocean Friendly list. Um, soon, I guess, we'll have a uh, recommendation for farm seaweed up there. And if all else fails, there's the ultimate combination of East and West, seaweed flavored Pringles. You can buy them on Amazon for $18. Frankly, I'm not that rich, so I haven't given it a go, but um, uh, did you ever try these, Paul? I think I've got a burrito. Oh, okay, he's not been brave enough. Okay, so somebody somewhere around the world will try seaweed flavored Pringles and tell us what they're like. But. So that's pretty much it for me now. I just wanna thank a few people, um, obviously Paul Dobbins, um, and the Ocean Approved crew, uh, Professor Jackson Chen, um, Eric Ask, Dr. John Forster, Gina Perens, and Lindsay Wood um, for helping us today. The New England Aquarium's uh, Canadian Committee for uh, accepting my project proposal and allowing me to do this, and my own supervisors who allow me to sort of moonlight a little bit and postpone the work I'm supposed to be doing to put this presentation together and uh, travel around the world to see some seaweed farms. So thank you very much. Okay, um, so I'm not sure all the times, but I'm sure we can fend a few questions. Okay, how about we go across this room, so we'll start with this young lady. Um, I just know there's a lot of pollution in China, so I wonder what issues they have with pollution of the waters where the seaweed is grown? Are mm -hmm. they, I don't know, what did, what did you find or what did they, what are they running into over there? Yeah, the, 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 I guess the, the first thing to say is that I'm not a food safety expert in any way, shape or form. Um, so I think a lot of the seaweeds can bioaccumulate all sorts of products in the, in the water. Um, I wouldn't want to make a generalization because a lot of times companies, I mean, Ocean Approved do this, are able to test their products before they're, they're sold. So it, it sort of would, you know, yes, there's a potential challenge. There's also a potential remedy through testing. Um, and I can't speak to the degree that that occurs or doesn't occur at this time. Do they have any use for the fronds that they cut off? 
yeah, the fronds, I'm sorry, they were the ones that are actually used for the wakami, the dry products. So once they chopped those off, they chopped them into smaller pieces and then put them through the tumble dry system. And so the, the stripe was the one, the main central bit that was chopped up and used in the stews. And the rest of it was used for the, the actually the higher value product of the wakami. Uh, this gentleman. Two part question. First of all, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, residue from the gasoline engines of the, the, the motor boats, is that a safety issue, a health issue regarding the seafood? Um, and then the second part is in the main industry, is there a growing season? Is there a time when the water is too warm or when conditions are too cold to be harvesting this? Okay, so the first question was does gasoline um, that's released from the boats get into the seaweed? Uh, I, I don't know enough to answer that question. Um, the second part of the question is, is there a, a growing season in Maine? Yeah. And yes, there is. Um, it runs from, I'm looking at Paul to say, I think it's November through to February? Uh, we, we see from, uh, we start seeding the last week of September, and we finish seeding uh, on Saturday. We start harvesting on the uh, second week of February, and we'll harvest seeding until about the end of the year. So the water temperature has to go below uh, 60 degrees. So that was from September to February, you said, and <coughs> based on water temperature. Uh, do you have any on the central piece? Let's look at this chap and then this lady, if that's okay. Is there any distributor network here in New England or in the US for uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, right? Are you talking about the Chinese product or the domestic? Uh, I'm sorry, Paul, do you want to answer that question? We'll come back to this gentleman. So this year lady here. Um, so two, two questions, really. So um, pricing of this product, I noticed on the slide uh, for Ocean Approved, there was you know, 65 in the corner. Are we talking about you know a pound? Are we talking how is it how is it sold? And and is the price uh, a lot higher here in the United States because of lack of demand? You know, well, there's not. I mean, is the price lower in China because there's so much of it, um, and that was one question. And then I'm assuming because of the water temperature, it can't be harvested on the west coast. It's really going to be an east coast uh, and a, you know cold water um, harvest. Okay, so there was two two questions there. The first question was um, the about the price yeah. um, of and whether or not there's a price difference between Chinese and American products. Um, I mean, the price that I that was on the, the screen came from um, Paul's website. I think it was sixty-five dollars for a five-pound bag of the the coleslaw or the, the seaweed um, slaw. I think there is a price difference. Um, the the price difference is primarily because a lot of the Chinese product is um, dried and then in some cases frozen and imported. And then Paul or the Ocean Approved um, market is trying to go for a very kind of premium end of it, being fresh. Um, and not having those dyes and other things, and again, having Brand America be part of it. So I don't think that there's a potential way for US producers to compete on a price basis for the same products as the Chinese. So they need to innovate and diversify, and that's something that Ocean Approved is sort of doing very well. And then there was a second question that I forgot. Oh, the second question was, I'm assuming it's gonna be a cold water harvest, so. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, the other question was um, whether or not it's possible to farm seaweeds on the West Coast based on the water temperature. I think that the challenge would, well, it's probably going to be different species. There are probably species of seaweeds that they can farm on the West Coast. Um, but I, I, 
I haven't really done enough research into seaweed to answer the question of what those species are. I certainly know they do do some giant kelp, I think, for um, feed for things like abalone on the west coast. So we'll carry out this in. This gentleman here in the blue shirt. So the question is, if, if a, a new seaweed farm is established, does it create habitat for other organisms? I, I haven't seen any research that to uh, quote you, but I would imagine that any time you put habitat in the marine environment, it's going to create you know, a, a space for creatures to come in and, and support. So potentially, it would have a, a localized biodiversity sort of improvement. Potentially as well, it, it can shade the seabed a tiny amount. So there's probably different uh, trade-offs with it. But at the scale that seaweed farming would occur in Maine, it's probably going to be very small scale anyway. In China, it's probably potentially a very different story, but I don't know. I haven't read enough to understand whether there's any real research into it and what, what findings that would be. Uh, carry on this, Jason. Is there an effort, effort to, to mechanize the process more? It seems like... You're going to try to do it in the states. You can't afford that with people. You know, paying your seaweed. You have to find some way of processing it. Uh, so the question is, is there a, a movement to mechanize the process of seaweed farming to reduce labor costs? Uh, I think that there's actually, in China, that was absolutely the case, that they were thinking about ways to reduce the, uh, the, the labor efforts based on the, the rising labor costs. So that was definitely a, a good source of uh, um, effort. I think in, in Maine as well, the processing side is something that Ocean Improved take very seriously and um, is something that they're working on, and I think that's a bit more proprietary. So, but I'm sure the answer is yes. So we will go back to this side, and this gentleman. Can we have about time for two more questions? Um, okay, we'll stick to you two, and maybe you first, sir. Uh, one last question.
the ocean in our lifetime, so we're trying to move towards practices that have the least environmental impact by providing the most nutrition as possible. When we move down the we move down the food chain, we move down to microalgae. And, uh, and we see a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we, we sell uh, all across the country, we sell in Canada, we have in the West, we sell in China, which is real cold to you guys, principally because of the quality of the water we make, and, uh, and then over to Europe. And so when we, when we try to think of our next business, if you see we, we travel to Asia, we travel to Europe, we say, you know, we can do this in the US. We can have a higher cost structure, um, but there is a market out there for it, and that's what we our costs will fall. So that's the kind of how we think about doing it. Where would be the pressure to be from flash reason? And one of the advantages that main seaweed has over some of the other seaweeds around the world is when our time goes up, that's the end. And that, you can attest to this, it does go up. Uh, and it gets cold, it freezes. And then when the time comes back, it unfreezes. So it's, it's, in working like a frozen vegetable, it is probably the nature's perfect. <laughs> we have seaweed that we've had in Greece for eight years. We take out the art, compare it to seaweed that we just processed that day. We can't help it. And, and, it really so it and, that, and that just kind of happened. We didn't go into it with that design. We just did not let them move. And sometimes certainly would be on the side of the country. Okay. Thank you uh, again. I just want to say thank you again to Paul Dobbins and his uh, Ocean Improved crew for coming down today giving us a little bit more of an information and hopefully converting some of us into, uh, into seaweed eaters. So please, again, try something new, look for Ocean Approved, and uh, have a look at our aquarium website for a few more ocean-friendly, uh, sustainable seafood choices. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you. Matt came up and his Woodland Aquarium has been very, very supportive of our efforts for the last five or six years, and very interested in what we're doing. And Matt came up on what might have been the oldest day <laughs> yeah. It was Ray Gruber came out and uh, in prose. And then I mentioned Heiko, and I wanted to show one of the great uh, neat things about Portland Harbor, which is our four gorges, which is the Civil War Fort. And uh, so we stopped by there, and I didn't realize it was going to be a great time. And so when we came back to the boat, we realized we were high and dry. So we got to spend a, a, a very cool three hours after the sun going down. We did. We didn't complain once. I'm sure when we got home, we might have complained. Well, if I remember, I stole your car keys, too. Uh, he had the same car as I did, and I think he just fell on the floor. And in the, in the, the frostbitten brain, I was like, oh, that's my car keys. And so we couldn't actually get back, and his wife had to come and pick us up. So uh, this is the real challenge for me. I, I visit shrimp farms all the time. It's really nice and warm. You know, you're more worried about getting a sunburn. So I had, like, boots that went about six inches high. And that wasn't the right idea in uh, getting on board and an off-board boat. But um, yes, again, thank you very much for your attention. Please come back uh, next week for the, the next lecture on plastics. <laughs>